Well, as we do prepare this morning for the Lord's table, I I still want us to turn back to Romans chapter 3 and continue our journey through the paragraph we're studying together. Those of you who are old enough to remember, remember that back in 1989, a clothing manufacturer opened its doors under the label, No Fear. And for a time during the early 90s, it seemed like that slogan was found everywhere on t-shirts across the country. It really was about participating in extreme sports, but ultimately the fad passed the extreme sports and became simply a popular way to say that I will do whatever I choose to do because I fear nothing and I fear no one. No fear. Now that is a stupid slogan. Sorry parents, I don't know a better word. The truth is, We puny human beings, whenever we are confronted with something that is truly great, it always produces in us a sense of fear and awe. You know this if you've ever actually experienced, been caught in a tornado, if you've ever been in the middle of one of those massive hurricanes, if you've ever been caught in the epicenter of an earthquake, Or if you've ever been in a tiny boat in the vast ocean, you know what it is to be caught in fear over something much greater than yourself. But the response of fear and awe that is produced by those created things is absolutely nothing compared to the human response when a creature simply created in God's image encounters the living and true God. How do people in Scripture respond when when they genuinely encounter God? Well, the Scripture is filled with examples. You remember Moses in Exodus chapter 3 God says to him, don't come any closer to this burning bush or you'll be incinerated. Instead, you better take the shoes off your feet because you're on holy ground. The children of Israel at Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 and 19, they perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, They trembled, and they stood at a distance. And they said to Moses, Moses, you speak to us, and we will listen, but don't let God speak to us, or we will die. The same is true in the New Testament era. You remember the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, are taken by Christ to the Mount of Transfiguration, where they get a glimpse of the glory of Christ And we read this in Matthew 17, 5 and 6, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. The apostle John Some 90 years old by the time he writes of this, on the Isle of Patmos for his faith, knew Christ, was the disciple whom Jesus loved, an apostle sent one by Christ to represent him. He's on the island of Patmos, and who shows up but Christ, his master, his Lord, his friend for those three and a half years. And when he saw a vision of the glorified Christ, when the real expression of the deity of Christ was shown, John says, Revelation 1.17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He says, I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. It's like a man in a coma. You see, it's impossible to see a genuine display of the greatness of God and still fail to respond in fear. It's only when our view of God is eclipsed either by our ignorance of God or by our sin that we can see God and not fear Him. 
according to Paul's indictment of all humanity in Romans chapter 3, that is exactly what has happened to us all. All of us have had our true view of the true God eclipsed by our ignorance of Him and by our sin. And therefore, we can see God and talk about God and and act like if we encountered God, everything would be fine. Paul says, that's an indictment of all humanity. Let's read the paragraph again together that we're studying. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we've already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, and their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known." There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in His sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin." Now in these verses, as we've noted, Paul summarizes and he proves from the Scripture his indictment of all humanity. He begins, as I noted in verse 9, with the formal indictment of man's depravity. The formal indictment. And then he follows in verses 10 to 18 with the biblical evidence for man's depravity. He introduces the biblical proof that all men are under sin. In verse 10, the evidence begins with a summary statement of human depravity. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. Paul then puts together a string of Old Testament references to illustrate the depth of that depravity, to show us how it has permeated every part of who we are. In verses 11 through 17, he he teaches us that we have darkened minds We have enslaved wills. We exhibit rebellious lifestyles and sinful behavior. In verses 13 to 14, we exhibit toxic speech. As we learned last time, that toxic speech spills over into destructive relationships in verses 15 to 17. The sin within our hearts leaks out, and it infects and destroys all human relationships. Now, we noted last time that there are reasons, three reasons specifically, behind this destruction. There is within each of us, according to verse 15, a predisposition to violent anger. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Of course, in its ultimate expression, nothing could be more apropos than that on the front page of our newspaper the last couple of days. Their feet are swift to shed innocent blood, to take and to destroy a man made in the image of God for the most frivolous of reasons or out of anger or even in the name of a false religion. We have a pattern of destroying relationships, verse 16, destruction and misery are in their paths. In other words, if you follow the path of a fallen human being in their wake, everywhere you look, you will find the debris of broken and devastated and shattered relationships. Verse 17 says there's no perception of the path of peace. The path of peace they have not known. Not only do they fail to walk in peace, they don't even know where to find the path that leads to peace. So Paul here lays out the biblical evidence for depravity in verses 10 through 18. As we've already seen, 
He provides in verse 10 a summary of depravity, and in verses 11 through 17, he explains the depth of human depravity. But we still have this sense, having studied as much as we have of this paragraph, that we have not yet reached the bottom. We have not yet arrived at ground zero. And that's where Paul takes us today, to what we could call the foundation of depravity. The foundation of depravity. If we attempt to to dig down to what lies behind man's sin, if we try to discern how it is that creatures respond to their Creator on whom they depend for everything by denying His existence, by using His name as a curse, by becoming openly antagonistic to Him, or in the case of others, as we saw in Romans 1, they even know so much about God from creation and conscience and providence, and yet in spite of that, instead of worshiping Him, instead of giving Him thanks, they create their own gods and fall down in front of stone and blocks of wood and other things in the creation. Still others respond to God the Creator by simply ignoring Him and living practically as though He didn't exist. You realize that nine out of every ten people on this planet believe in a supreme being, and yet most of them still live as if there weren't one. Humans sin with impunity, without any fear, it seems, of punishment. And then there are those who grow up in Christian homes and and attend churches like this one and hear the gospel again and again and again. And in their hardness and in their pride, again and again, they refuse the offers of God's mercy and grace. Now, how in the world do human beings who are creatures of a day respond to God their Creator in those ways? Well, Paul says there's really only one reason. There's only one explanation for such behavior. Verse 18, it's because there is no fear of God before their eyes. Here is the foundation. Here is the root cause, the basic reason, the primary source behind all other sins. Now, Paul is quoting here from Psalm 36, verse 1. I won't take you back there, but there is an interesting twist in the language, the Hebrew language of Psalm 36, 1. Let me quote it for you literally as it reads in the Hebrew text. An oracle of transgression regarding the wicked in the midst of my heart. That's what David writes. It's a little enigmatic, a little difficult to understand, but I think this is what David means. As David reflects in his own heart about the wickedness of fallen sinners, he can only conclude that the reason they sin is because there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, why does he say before their eyes? He refers to the eyes because, as you understand, the eyes direct our steps. We look... We even use expressions like, look where you're going. The eyes direct our steps. And so what David is implying here is that a legitimate fear of God has absolutely no place in directing our daily steps, the course of our lives. Fallen human beings disregard the fear of God entirely in setting the course for their life. We may be philosophical atheists, or we may simply be pragmatic or practical atheists, but regardless, for all of fallen humanity, God is left completely out of the life. John Murray writes, the fear of God is appropriately expressed as before our eyes because the fear of God means that God is constantly in the center of our thought and apprehension. And life is characterized by the all-pervasive consciousness of dependence upon Him and responsibility to Him. The absence of this fear means that God is excluded not only from the center of thought and calculation, but from the whole horizon of our reckoning. 
God is not in all our thoughts. Figuratively, he is not before our eyes. Now, in the light of what we saw in Romans 1, this is startling. Because remember, in Romans 1, we read and learned that God has made himself evident in his creation. Everywhere we look, we see God. But here we learn that fallen man can choose not to keep seeing, not to set God before his eyes. Contrast that, by the way, with the true believer. Psalm 16, 8, the psalmist says, I have set the Lord continually before me. That's what believers do. They set God before them. They live quorum Deo. They live as if it's before the face of God. They live in the awareness that there's nowhere they can go where God doesn't exist. And setting the Lord before our eyes causes us to fear Him. And if we fear Him, we will turn away from sin and we will obey Him. This connection is made throughout Scripture, everywhere. Uh, countless references. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Deuteronomy 5.29. God says, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always. You see the connection? If you fear me, God says, you'll keep all my commandments always. Job 1.1 1, 1, Job was blameless, upright, fearing God, and therefore turning away from evil. When you fear God, you turn away from sin. Proverbs 3, 7. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. You see, it is an understanding of God and fearing Him properly that moves us toward obedience. John Calvin writes, Righteousness, that is a life that conforms to God's standard, righteousness flows from only one principle, the fear of God. Now think about that with me. You understand this. It's true. Think about a specific sin that you struggle with. A specific sin. I can promise you this, there are certain people before whom and certain circumstances in which you would never think of committing that sin. You say, well, you know, I don't have that much control. I, I sin. You do have control because there are certain people before whom and certain circumstances in which you would never commit that sin. Perhaps it's in front of your parents or in front of your spouse, or perhaps it's in front of your peers. Or perhaps it's with, with some spiritual leader in your life. Maybe if I were present, you wouldn't think about committing that sin. Now why? Why would you never commit that sin in the presence of that person? It's because of fear of what would happen if they knew. But God knows. And yet we still sin. Why? Why? either because we don't truly believe that God sees us or because we don't truly fear Him. So a failure to fear God, then, is the foundation of our depravity. But what exactly is the fear of God? What is the fear of the Lord? Well, when Scripture speaks of the fear of God or the fear of the Lord, it's used in one of three ways. Let me briefly give these to you so that you understand what it means to fear God. One of three ways. Number one, it's used of true believers and true worship of God. In other words, it's shorthand for someone who's a true believer. In New Testament terms, who's a Christian. When the Bible speaks about one who fears the Lord or those who fear the Lord, it is often a description of those who have come to be true believers in the true God and who truly worship Him. Genuine believers fear God. For example, Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. You can't even begin the path to wisdom without fearing God. That's where it starts. Proverbs, I'm sorry, Psalm 31, verse 19. Here we learn that those who fear the Lord is shorthand for 
those who are true believers. Psalm 31, 19, how great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you have wrought for those who take refuge in you. To take refuge in God, to believe in God, and again, in, in terms of the New Testament, to believe in God through His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to take refuge in Christ is to fear Him. And to fear Him means you've taken refuge. Malachi 3.16, then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. Psalm 103.17, the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, on whom? On those who fear him. Even in the New Testament, this is true. Revelation 19, verse 5 a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you His slaves, you who fear Him. So Scripture often uses the expression, those who fear the Lord, to identify those who have come to truly believe in the living God and who worship the one true God. Let me put it as bluntly as I can. If you don't fear God, you're not a Christian. Now, the fear of the Lord is used, secondly, of reverence and awe for God. Reverence and awe. Now, let me define these words because we, we use them, but I'm not sure we're always clear on what they mean. Webster's defines reverence as an attitude of deep respect tinged with or mixed with awe. Deep respect mixed with awe. So what's awe? Well, awe is an emotion variously combining dread, veneration, and wonder that is inspired by authority or by the sacred or by the sublime. In other words, you look at something and you are moved to wonder. You are moved to dread. You are moved to adore, to venerate. That's awe. And this is what it means to fear God. It means to see God for who He is and to be moved to respect Him deeply mixed with this sense of wonder and amazement and be overwhelmed with who God is. Deuteronomy 28, 58. You must be careful to observe all the words of this law which are written in this book to fear this honored and awesome name, the Lord your God. Because God inspires awe. That's awesome. Because He inspires wonder and dread and adoration. You're moved by what you behold about God. You fear Him. In Psalm 33, verse 8, let all the earth fear the Lord. And then He explains what He means. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of God. Be moved to wonder. Malachi 2.5, God says of Levi, Levi feared me, and by that I mean he stood in awe of my name. My character, the things that were true about me, he was overwhelmed by what he knew about me. You see, to fear God is to have an attitude of deep respect combined with a sense of wonder inspired by who God is and by what God has done and frankly by what God could do if he chose to. Now there's a third way scripture uses the fear of the Lord and that is terror or dread of God. You see when God is truly seen either in person or in his word and when he is properly understood he always inspires terror in human beings. This happens, by the way, sometimes unintentionally. God shows up in a visible appearance, in what we call a theophany. And how do people respond? They're terrified. I shared several examples with you just a few moments ago. Remember John on the Isle of Patmos? When I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. Other times in Scripture, it's not unintentional. 
God intends to bring terror to the hearts of people. For example, Psalm 211, talking about the Messiah and the necessity of every man to humble himself before the Messiah. He says, worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. When you come to the Messiah, you better understand who you're dealing with, and it ought to cause your knees to knock. It ought to drive you to the ground. Jeremiah 5.22, God says, Do you not fear me, declares the Lord? Do you not tremble in my presence? God says, really? You don't tremble in my presence? Turn to Isaiah chapter 2. In Isaiah 2, Isaiah is describing the future day of the Lord. That time when God unleashes His judgment on the earth. It's called in the prophets the day of the Lord. It's called God's day here. And in that day, Isaiah three times says that sinful people will hide from the terror that is God Himself. Isaiah 2, verse 10. Again now, this is the day of the Lord in the future, the day of judgment, when God comes to make things right. We sang about it this morning. Enter the rock and hide in the dust, verse 10, from the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of His majesty. The proud look of man will be abased and the loftiness of man will be humbled. Listen, there won't be anybody proud on that day. And the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. For Yahweh of armies will have his day. Go down to verse 19. On that day, men will go into the caves of the rocks and into the holes of the ground before the terror of the Lord. They'll be like rats scurrying to get away. And the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. Verse 21. They'll go into the caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the cliffs before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of His majesty when He arises to make the earth tremble. And therefore, stop regarding man whose breath of life is in his nostrils, for why should he be esteemed? Isaiah says, you want to know who to fear? Don't make it some person. It ought to be God. In fact, I would say this, Isaiah tells us here in this chapter that only the Lord is truly terrifying. There's nothing else that's truly terrifying, but God is. So those are the three senses or the ways the fear of God is used in Scripture. It's used of true believers and true worship. It's used of reverence and awe in the sight of God and His greatness. And it's used of terror and dread when you encounter God in person or when you're anticipating His judgment. Now, in the New Testament, there is only one primary Greek word for fear. It's the word phobos, from which we get the English word phobia. It's the word used in Romans 3, 18. Because it's one general word, it's hard to know, based on that word, which sense of the word Paul means in Romans 3, but fortunately he's quoting from Psalm 36. Psalm 36, 1, the psalmist uses a Hebrew word that only means one thing, dread or terror. He's talking about this third sense of the word. So David did not intend to say, and therefore Paul does not intend to say, that the problem is sinners fail to respond to God with true worship or they fail to hold God in reverence and awe. He's saying, The real problem is they don't even respond to God with terror and with dread. Fallen man has no terror at the thought of God. Think about that. Think about all the things people fear. Think about what you fear. You know, people fear accidents. They fear violence. They fear ISIS. They fear cancer. And of course, all people fear death. Imagine fearing all of those things and not fearing God before whom every person must give an account. The unbeliever has no sense that in his rebellion he should live every moment of his life in sheer terror of God. 
Instead, Paul says, there is no fear of God before his eyes. No terror at the thought of God. Now, why is that? Well, Scripture tells us there are several reasons unbelievers do not fear God in these three senses. Let me just give them to you briefly. Several reasons that unbelievers don't fear God. Number one, they have no understanding of God's revelation. Ultimately, all true knowledge of the fear of God comes through the Scripture. Deuteronomy 4.10 says, uh, the Lord said to Moses, assemble the people to me that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on earth. God says, let me speak to them. In, his, in that case, personally, they heard his voice. Let me speak to them so that they may learn to fear me. We learn to fear God through the, an understanding of his word. In fact, in Psalm 19, verse 9, that, that section about God's Word, the fear of the Lord is used as a synonym for Scripture itself. In Psalm 86, 11, the psalmist writes, Teach me your way, O Lord, and when you do teach me your way, unite my heart to fear your name. When I really understand your Word, I'll fear you. Because unbelievers don't understand God's revelation, they have no fear of God. A second reason they don't fear God is they have no sense of God's greatness. Sadly, we live in a day when advertisers have completely destroyed the English language. I'm breakfast cereal is great. In fact, I was fascinated this week to look up the word great in the English dictionary. I'm not making this up. There is actually an informal sense of the word great that means satisfactory. But the real definition of great is unusually large in size or dimensions, unusual in degree, power, intensity, wonderful, notable, remarkable, exceptional, outstanding. By that definition, God alone is great. And everything about God is great. His character, His ability, His power, His works, they're all great. And when you understand that, you fear him. Turn to Job 37. Elihu is talking to Job here, and he makes a remarkable statement. Verse 21 of Job 37, he uses the sun as, a, as an illustration. He says, now men do not see the light which is bright in the skies, but the wind has passed and cleared them. Out of the north comes golden splendor, around God is awesome majesty. Now, what's going on here? He's saying, look, if you go out in the middle of, of the day and you look up at the sun, you can't do it. The sun overwhelms you with its blazing splendor. He says, just imagine what it would be like and how it would overwhelm you to try to look at God. He goes on to say, the Almighty, we cannot find Him. He is exalted in power Verse 24, once you get this idea of God's greatness, therefore men fear Him. But because fallen man lacks a true sense of the greatness of God, he fails to fear Him. By the way, if you haven't read, beginning in Job 38 through chapter 41 recently, read those three chapters sometime this week, because it's God putting His own greatness on display. And when you lack a true sense of the greatness of God, you don't fear God. But when you get a sense of His greatness, you, you begin to see. A third reason unbelievers do not fear God is they have no sense of God's power. This is similar to the second point, but slightly different. Exodus 14.31 says, When Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians... The people feared the Lord. When they saw God's power, they feared Him. I remember when I was young, sitting in our little wood frame house in Mobile, Alabama, as the house itself was shaking, as the roof was threatening to be pulled off and sucked into the storm at any moment as Hurricane Camille passed some 30 or 40 miles away. 
I can promise you this, everyone in our house, everyone anywhere near that storm that night feared God because we saw a glimpse, just just the fringes of his power. A fourth reason that sinners do not fear God is that they have no sense of God's judgment. People assume that God is not going to judge them. They assume that God will not bring temporal judgment for their sin into their lives here. The truth is exactly the opposite. God does execute temporal judgments even on unbelievers during this life. It's not just about the future. There's testimony throughout the Scripture that God does this. Cain is the first example. Throughout this life, God marks Cain. He endures God's judgment even during this life. And the Old Testament and the New is littered with examples of unbelievers and of nations, both individuals and nations, who experienced God's temporal judgment in this life. Oh, and by the way, believer, you and I will not stand before God in judgment for our sin But that doesn't mean we should take God lightly. God will discipline you and me in this life. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 29. We're going to take of the Lord's table. He who eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and some are dead. 1 Peter 1.17, if you address as Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. Fear of what? Fear of displeasing the Father and fear of His fatherly discipline. Listen, if you grew up in a godly home, even if you knew your dad loved you, you feared the discipline that would come. You better fear that discipline from your heavenly Father. He is not going to let you sin with impunity and not deal with that in this life. People also assume that God will not judge and punish their sin in the future. You know, Jesus was, he had so much to say about this. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, he said this Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul. Don't fear ISIS. The worst they can do is kill your body. He says, here's who you ought to fear. Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus says, that's who you ought to be afraid of. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 Notice verse 26. The writer of Hebrews is here talking about those who attach themselves to the Christian faith are not true believers, but are connected to the Christian faith and who then choose at some point in their life just to walk away, to abandon it all. And the writer says this, if we go on, this is verse 26 of Hebrews 10, if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. This is apostasy. But instead, if that's you, you ought to expect a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume God's enemies. And he says, look, under the Mosaic law, if you committed a capital offense with two or three witnesses, you were put to death. Verse 29, how much severer punishment do you think he will deserve? And here's what it's like to hear the gospel, hear the gospel, and to walk away from the Christian faith. It's to trample underfoot the Son of God. It's to regard as unclean His blood. It's to insult the Spirit of grace. You better remember, God said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Verse 31, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. If you have refused to repent and believe in God's Son... God says you should live in terror every day of your life until you're willing to give up your rebellion and turn to Him. Paul argues that it is the absence of a fear of God that is behind all the sin in the world. If you're not in Christ, as you sit here this morning, there's only one real reason for that. 
it's because you don't really fear God. You don't really understand His greatness. You don't understand His power. You don't understand the coming judgment. If you're in Christ, I've had to come to grips with this my own, in my own heart this week. If you're in Christ, you don't fear God the way you should fear God. I don't fear God the way I ought to fear God. But here's the wonderful reality, Christian. I was struck by a verse in Isaiah this week, Isaiah 11.3, which says, The Messiah will delight in the fear of God. Jesus lived for 33 years in perfect fear of God. And he lived in my place, fearing God the way I ought to fear him. And believer, fearing God the way you ought to fear him. And therefore, God sees me as if I had lived my entire life fearing him exactly as I should. That's the gospel. Let's pray together. Our Father, we have already taken time together to confess our sin to You and prepare our hearts for the Lord's table. And yet, having studied what we just studied, we we come now seeking Your forgiveness for a failure to fear You the way we ought to fear You. Oh God, forgive us for seeing that view of You eclipsed by our ignorance of You, by our sin, so that we don't fear you as we ought. Father, forgive us for Christ's sake. Thank you that for those of us in Christ, He did fear you as we should, and that in your grace, you now treat us as if we had. Father, forgive us, cleanse us, enable us to take of the Lord's table in a way that remembers His death for sin. Thank you that though there was a time in our lives when we had no fear of you, that now you have brought us by definition to be those who fear you. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.